Hey coaches, welcome to this afternoon's presentation for the Football Scoop Online Clinic. Uh, today, really fired up to have Arizona Director of uh, Strength and Conditioning, Brian Johnson, join us to talk, uh, you know, about the direction that really coaches should be looking at going once we're able to return from this quarantine, which I think there's a, I know there's a lot of coaches out there interested in, in the direction that, that we need to take when we get back. So, Coach Johnson, the floor is yours, man. I appreciate that, Doug. Uh, first and foremost, just kind of want to say hello to everybody and, and thank you for listening in and, and, and means you at least somewhat look at me as deeming me valid as someone to listen to in this whole uh, situation and how to approach uh, coming back. Uh, but I really just want to wish everybody health and, and praying that everybody's uh, loved ones are safe and, and that you're all kind of enjoying each other in the quarantine and, and, and then saying prayers for, you know, the people that know or are being affected by this whole virus and pandemic that's going on around the world right now. Uh, just the title is Return to Play, you know, a, a new approach post-COVID-19. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at uh, models that, that are already in place, but you know, that, that title tells you a new approach on how we can handle this thing just in college, high school, uh, moving forward. So the first slide, uh, a united approach, all right? And I think what we're realizing is, is even with this situation going on right now, uh, that it takes everybody uh, to, to, to be in a situation or be at a point where we all have to help each other people staying in the house who might have symptoms, they don't know they have symptoms, but you don't want to come across the people who do have, who, who will be affected if you give whatever you have to them. I um, mean, that's, that's the same thing as, as how we need to approach uh, returning to play, a united approach. Everyone has to be on the same page. That's football, position coaches, strength and conditioning, nutrition, medical, sports psychology, uh, academic staff and scheduling, and then most importantly, our athletes, because we're asking them to be accountable, hold themselves accountable, hold each other accountable uh, while they're at home and in their respective, uh, you know, places in quarantine and, and doing at least something so when they come back, we aren't just completely starting uh, from zero. Uh, and I think that's really the biggest piece is, is our athletes have to be on board with this. So expressing the importance of communicating with those uh, those, the, the athletes or your players. Uh, and then, you know, one of the first steps is, is how do we transition from one phase to the next? Uh, and when should these transitions happen once we come back? Uh, and that's a, everyone has in their mind what that transition will look like. Uh, but what is, what is the first step? Um, and then, you know, I asked my que this question, what do we measure? Uh, what is reliable? Um, you know, as, uh, a strength coach, right? We're, we're measuring things all the time, meaning we're testing, we're getting some type of data, whether that's, you know, jump, vertical jumps, we're timing 10s or 20s or 40s. Uh, you know, what are we measuring? If you're measuring it, you're deeming it as important, all right? So those are the first things that I think we have to go and we have to rely on when it comes back and into progressing back into to play. Um, you know, for me, we use force decks, we have Norboard, uh, we, we have GPS Catapult, right? Everybody does not, doesn't have those resources, but everybody does some, something uh, to, to test. So don't, you, relying on that data from back before we got started is gonna be very important. Uh, and, and what are those performance variables to let us know that it's time to transition? Uh, then we have to ask ourselves, uh, what are we prepping our athletes for? Uh, my old boss, Mark Uyama, uh, who's now at the Minnesota Vikings when I was with the, with the 49ers, uh, always talked about, you know, setting a goal, looking at the end goal. Where do we want our athletes to be at the end of whatever phase we are going into practice or competition? And let's work backwards from there, okay? Meaning uh, we, we want them to be at peak power, peak strength, uh, peak mass velo max velocities, all of these good things. All right, but what are the means to get to the to that end goal? Um, and then a, another big one is communicate, communicating. All right, uh, sitting down every day, those some, those same people that have to be on the same page, talk about what we're seeing on a daily basis. Are there any trends? Um, and then you know, staying on track, uh, and you might have to make slight changes. And a lot of that has to, you know, we have to, you know, let go of our ego. 
All right, there shouldn't be any decisions made until everyone who, who was involved uh, has input, has say so. Uh, it's okay if someone else has a better idea than you. Uh, that's what teams are all about, all right? And if, if we're gonna ask our players to be uh, a good team or teammates, then we, we have to show that administrative level uh, as well. And then, you know, trust the plan, stick to the plan, but don't hesitate to, to make changes in the meantime. Ooh. All right. So with all, all that being said, and, and for us to be able to move forward, I think, especially for me, all right, I know for me, I, need, I needed to look at uh, where were we before COVID and the quarantines and the closing down of the campuses and, and the weight room. Uh, so March, we were, we had just finished our first week of practice. Uh, so we were in a deload uh, that first week, just a lot of players to, to adapt to new stress, right, of, of practice. So we decreased the volume and training frequency. Um, th that, that first week of practice was a four-day split. So we practiced Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was off, and then Thursday and Friday. Uh, so then we had three lifts. Uh, and then we manipulated our lifts based off what that practice was going to look like. I can I'll get into that later. And then after that first week, we had a spring break. Uh, so after spring break, uh, the plan was uh, to go into, you know, a general strength phase. Once again, decreasing uh, the volume, but keeping enough intensity there to, to improve, uh, you know, I don't want to say maintain, to still improve strength just because we aren't in a situation where we were practicing every day. We still had days in between for uh, ample opportunity to recover. So there was no need to just completely back off because spring is a, a, a huge developmental phase for on the field uh, in, the, in a specific sport, but also in the weight room. Uh, and then once again, our lifts just depended on the practice. Um, so this is just a, a, a look into how uh, at Arizona we structure our practices. All right, and, and we have a color system. So what you're seeing are the days of practice and what cut that, that the color represents what type of day that is. Um, this helps us manipulate the day based off uh, certain metrics that we use. Uh, and then and we, we prescribe certain metrics to help us manipulate, manipulate that. So we look at volume, that's, the, that's everything throughout the day. Uh, we have density metrics, we have intensity metrics, and then we look at max velocity. Um, we use it in a, in a daily undulation. We have some weekly undulating going on there uh, to ensure that we aren't just blasting the players and that there is a smooth transition uh, into to play. And we look at these variables and make sure we hit our, our player load, which is, is a volume metric, our player load uh, numbers for that day. So we do a lot of manipulating uh, to make sure we get there. Um, so you know, it, it helps us, you know, follow the projected uh, spring schedule. It eases them into practice. Um, throughout the entire spring, uh, we increase their, their capacity for, for volume. So their work capacity increases with every day. So the first red practice, which are our lower days, uh, will, will be our, our second red day, I'm sorry, will be higher than the first red day. So there's always a gradual progression uh, to make sure that once we get to the back end and the scrimmages get a little more intense, people are being eased into roles, you know, maybe a second string guy is taking a starter spot or a, a, a starter has solidified a spot and they're getting the majority of the reps. Everybody has progressed and is ready uh, to, to perform and handle the loads that are going to be required for them as we get into the, the deeper parts of uh, spring. And then it gives us opportunity to see how how our players will handle uh, game loads in that time span. Um, so uh, it, we do the same thing in training. This is spring ball, but we still have a, a very similar graph when it comes to training. How we want to progress the loads, how we want to manipulate those metrics based off what we want to see, <clears throat> excuse me, for the day. Next slide kind of breaks down our color system a little more, okay, and, and I'll start from the bottom going up. Our red days are our lighter days. You can see our player load target was, it, player load is a number of like total stress for the day. Um, and that's just the best way to sum it out without getting into who, to, to too much. All right, and then you see a, a range of 250 to 300 player load. 
Uh, we like to use ranges when it comes to our metrics because it allows for our outliers to be our outliers, right? And there, you'll have outliers on two opposite ends of the spectrum. You'll have your, your high guys that can handle really high loads on, and they'll always be those guys. And, but then you have guys that might not get as much uh, in practice, maybe because they're uh, second or third string, or maybe their role is strictly special teams. So they won't get a lot of team periods, but in special teams, they're going. They're usually going to be your guys. Uh, they're going to get some, some higher velocities just because they have an opportunity uh, to, to, to run downfield uh, without a, a defender or someone impeding uh, their progress until they've hit uh, max velocity. I mean, that's why we track those guys, because we want to make sure they're able to handle some of those velocities and preparing them uh, for going into the game. Uh, on these practice, on this red day, we also, uh, we manipulate what we do in the weight room. So it's a, it's, a, it's a shorter practice day. There won't really be any opportunities for max velocity. Uh, as you can see, 70, 72, 77% isn't fast at all. Uh, so we'll, we'll, hit, we'll have a lower body emphasis on that day. That's usually the start of the week uh, or coming off of, of a break, like what you would have seen in that last um, slide. And then we get to our yellow day. That target, obviously, is going to be higher. Um, the velocities pick up. We usually have more of an upper body emphasis uh, on that day just because it's going to involve a little more running, a little more volume, a little more intensity. Uh, and then green, okay, obviously, that's our bigger day. Right? And these targets, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're ranging from, you know, that first green day all the way to that last green day. This is kind of where we want to want to stay in that range. Uh, the velocities are fast. We get a little more uh, competitive on those. So we have more team uh, periods where we might get some up-tempo stuff in Indy and some other periods. Um, and then as far as what we do in the weight room on that day, uh, we don't want to do too much just because that's going to be a pretty stressful day. So it says like a recovery uh, lift. We'll hit it pre or post. Um, and, and that'll be more just for you know, blood flow, really like a cool down, uh, honestly. Now, you know, we also apply a color system to our periods. So the day will be a color, and then we, we manipulate the period uh, with a color as well. So obviously on our big green day, there are more periods that are green, right? So they're competitive, they're team, we're getting a lot of situational ball, special teams might be competitive, that's when we get those full speed sprints. Uh, down the field by those guys. And we, we're watching all this live. We have a laptop uh, with a sensor outside that picks up what everybody is doing. It helps us uh, just keep track of what we need to see. Once again, our outliers, right? The, the guys who are the outliers on one intersection where they get really high lows, they're all, always hitting uh, top speeds. If we have a guy that maybe we know, okay, he's, he, he, he gets some of those 500, 600 player lows on these days and you know, he gets accumulated volume of that player load or some of our other metrics. And we know, okay, we start getting instances where he's going into the training room to get extra stretching or to get some type of treatment. Uh, so we communicate with the coaches and they, we all, I, we talk about those guys on a daily basis in our staff meetings. So we're able to, uh, you know, identify them and intervene when need be, okay? And sometimes it, it, it won't even be a case where, uh, intervention has someone in tennis shoes and a ball cap on the sideline. We're just being very strategic about where we place that player. Uh, what periods are important, right? We don't want to wear them down or pre fatigue them in individual period uh, where they're getting a lot of stuff that if they're a high guy, they, they, they're probably really, really good at. Uh, so we save them for more of those green periods where we're competing, where we're in team situations. And that's where they'll get the bulk of their load, but it still won't be, it'll be under that threshold uh, to where, you know, we don't get uh, undesired result. Um, so the, the, the periods are, are, are colored, yellow day, same thing, there'll be more yellow periods. And trust me, there aren't any days where there are no uh, green periods. I mean, we, we still get after it, we still work. We just undulate and we're real strategic in how we do that. Now, one of the big manipulators of all of that load, if you don't have GPS, it's just time. How much time are we spending to practice? How much time are we spending in, 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 in these drills? And then you, next you can look at uh, 
reps. How many reps are we getting in these periods? And, and time regulates that as well. So it all kind of works together. All right, and next, uh, where will we be today? We were still operating uh, normally. Uh, and, and you know, most strength coaches, we like to program for the year. And we'll make little changes as we go, depending on what we're seeing. Uh, but April, all right, that's, we be this would actually be the first week after the spring game. All right, so we, we'd be in a new phase. We'd be, what is this, Tuesday? So we'd be in day two of a, of a new phase. Uh, phase four, we're going to a little functional hypertrophy. We got some strength gains uh, during spring ball. So uh, that's just where we, that's where we would be. We'd be back to eight hour weeks. We do a four day upper lower split. Uh, and then every third day, Wednesday, Saturday, we like to get a little recovery in. <clears throat> uh, we'd be hitting, we work from eight reps and work down to six, see how those percentages increase over time. So once the intensity uh, increases, we want to decrease the volume, of course. Um, and then we continue working acceleration and a lot of max velocity technique, uh, kind of ramping up April, knowing that we're going into May, uh, which would have been a break, four-week break, uh, where we, we send them home with stuff, kind of very similar to what we sent home now is uh, some GPP work, some general, general physical preparation. Uh, basic movements, goblet squats, front squats, things of those nature. Uh, tempo runs, maintain conditioning, and then just uh, basic uh, plyometrics. Uh, so you know, once again, it's very similar to what we're what we're sending them now. Uh, you know, you got guys who have full-on gyms in the garage because maybe their father or whoever they like to have people in the neighborhood come and they have lifting sessions, and we have. We communicate that there are some guys that have some of that stuff going on, but you know, for the most part, uh, everyone's confined to the house, so we don't have a uh, guys with a lot of equipment. So, what are the things that we can get the most bang for our buck with uh, that guys can do in small spaces, uh, whether it's a backyard, whether it's a courtyard, an apart apartment complex, might just be like a hallway outside of the door of the apartment complex, or a little patio outside of a town home. Or you can go right outside in front of the house uh, on the street. So what kind of things uh, can we program uh, for that? So we know we're not getting a whole lot of load right now. All right, the intensity won't be there unless they have a full gym. Uh, so for the most part, we're trying to prescribe a lot of things with time under tension, essential work, isometric work, a uh, ton of core work. We sent them home with some like Tabata, uh, and, and contralateral circuits that they can do right there at home with minimal equipment. Um, you know, if you do have a little space where you might have 10 to 15 yards, like in front of the house in the street or the backyard or front yard, we prescribe them some acceleration, a little change of direction work, you know, working in short spaces, uh, putting them in the right position. Everything has been regressed from, you know, day one movements. Uh, and then, uh, and then just uh, anything with max velocity is really just going to be technical, all right? Obviously, we don't have, you know, anything past, you know, 15, 20 yards where guys can get those top speeds, but at least they can work on those techniques. So when we get back, it's a shorter, shorter transition out of acceleration work into max velocity work uh, without any occurrences uh, going on. And then we just, me and my staff, and especially my staff, we've just done a really good job of keeping in touch with, each guy, every week, we're doing individual calls with, with everyone on the team, finding out any obstacles that they may be um, coming across with what they have, encouraging them not to go to gyms, not to go to huge uh, the parks where a lot of people are around. We're, we're really encouraging them to abide by the social distancing rules. Um, so trying to help them solve, problem solve uh, a lot of the obstacles that they're going to run across on a daily basis, just like we're running into ourselves here at home. Uh, and so moving out of, you know, these, the kind of the past or what would have been uh, moving into now, what needs to happen, uh, just the events that help prepare me uh, for what's coming, right? And, and we still don't know what's coming, but at least we can take some of these, you know, rely on past experience uh, and just understanding, you know, 
what's how to handle what's coming right even though we still don't know what we do know is is that we're going to have a short period of time from uh coming uh, reporting back to to possibly playing we know that we're not going to have that normal time all right that's absolute so you know i'm looking at the things that where things may have been accelerated or uh or or decrease or increase whatever uh in my coaching so First and foremost, the two years of coaching in the NFL, the San Francisco 49ers, I was exposed to the OTA model. Now, those two years in the NFL, uh, I actually had two head coaches, uh, which at the time was, was very stressful. Uh, the uncertain, uncertainty uh, with, with having two coaches in two years and not knowing what's going to happen next. Uh, but now, you know, looking back on that, it was really a good experience because I got two different perspectives and how coaches handle OTAs. And that was really good for my grooming uh, just because it gave me an opportunity uh, to, to see work two different ways, right? You, you want to gain as much experience as you can for these situations because we might you might be working for a different head coach and then another head coach comes in and you're able to keep your job because you're able to formulate and take what that coach wants and, 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 and make that coach right. And to me as strength coaches, that is our job to make our head coach right any way possible. Uh, meaning that we have to adjust some of the things we may be normally used to doing or we're able to apply what we're used to doing under different circumstances, which is why I feel like, you know, I, I would be prepared. I feel confident that I'm prepared for whatever is going to come. Um, so, Another instance was summer 2019, we played Hawaii in week negative one. All right, that was August 24th. Um, I wanna say the 31st that next week, it was considered week zero. And the 7th of September was week one uh, for everybody else. So we had six weeks in the summer to prepare with guys coming off of a four week break in, in, in May. So, you know, we had to accelerate some of our training a little bit be real strategic on when we place things, how we place them and, and the pace uh, and, and those transition times we had to be uh, really smart about. So that was a, that was a real challenge. Uh, and then on top of that, thinking that everything's pushed up and then we had a long week there in Hawaii that we had to prepare uh, the guys for to be able to go and perform. Uh, another kind of <laughs> circumstance that I think is also is not making ball games these last two years, which that's, that's nothing that I'll ever be happy about. I think none of us would ever be happy about not getting to postseason play. Uh, but I also think that it did prepare me for long breaks at home where they have five and a half, six weeks away from me. Uh, and then having a short period of time where I had to get them ready for practice. All right. So uh, for example, this spring, we had five and a half weeks from when they reported to our first week of spring ball. Three and a half of those weeks uh, were uninterrupted training. So it was just us with the guys. Uh, and then we had two weeks where the coaches came in and, and, and two hours, uh, I don't say taken from me, but that's really kind of what they were. Two, two hours were shifted towards uh, something else other than just training with me. Uh, so once again, I just looked at past experience and, you know, controllable variables. Uh, I attached our training to those sessions with the coaches. Uh, and, and that method I think worked because instead of me feeling like I lost two hours, uh, it was a smooth transition kind of from my general preparation to general specific preparation. And then that specific preparation and skill acquisition came once they were with the coaches, they were able to go, uh, through individual periods, we had a new defensive staff in, so it was great for them to kind of lay their foundation and it, it piggybacked really well off what we were doing as a strength staff once those coaches took over. Uh, so that that method really worked uh, for us. And I was that first week of practice. I mean, it would have been nice to see week two and week three and week four, obviously, but that that's not the circumstance. And I, we were very pleased with what we saw week one from the team, just from the loads they were able to handle, they were exposed because we did it that week. So instead of having like a three-part day where they run, lift, and then the player run practice, everything was right there at the same time, very similar to, to simulate what a practice was going to look like. And then in those loads and that, that week leading into that first week of spring ball were very similar. 
Uh, so we were very happy about that, that we were able to kind of bring those things together. And a lot of that happened because of past experience and honestly, things that we felt good about and also things that we would probably consider mistakes or things that we could have done better. And I think that uh, we have to learn from, from all of those things equally. Uh, next is just, you know, have we seen this before, right? And, and we haven't seen this in, in the form of a, a pandemic before, right? This is new to everyone. So from that standpoint, no, we have not seen it. But have we seen anything in sport that would that we could draw some type of conclusions from, or at least look to 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 try to learn from uh, in sport where an off season or something might have been taken away? And that's a 2014, I'm sorry, 2011 NFL lockout. All right, uh, and. There, there, there was a study done where they looked at Achilles tendon ruptures. All right, so just we'll go down the line. Achilles tendon repair require approximately about 50% reduction in power ratings. And in this article, they had certain standards that they look at in performance on the field, certain stats uh, from certain players. Uh, and they looked at the players who were coming off of a, a tendon, Achilles tendon repair. Uh, rapid, rapid transition of younger players into high-level structured practice without regular preparatory training sessions uh, needed opportunity to gradually adapt to the rigors of NFL training. All right, and that's really points out to where we are. We're, we're at younger athletes. I want to say uh, in the number of Achilles ruptures they had in a certain period of time, which I'll get to down there further on the list in the NFL, they found that half of those players were, were rookies. And there are a lot of variables as to why that was the case. And positive dose response relationship has been demonstrated in a minimum of six to eight weeks of training, excuse me, uh, appear needed of positive changes toward enhanced injury prevention profiles. All right, so that kind of speaks for itself in saying that they're saying that a minimum of six to eight weeks of some type of training or some type of easing into transitioning into full practice in full competition. All right, in that NFL lockout, uh, no football activities were conducted from March 11th to July 25th, so they missed an entire off-season session. Okay, now uh, there was a, there was this was the year the new CBA. The reason what of the lockout, they had just drawn up in that CBA to take five weeks from the original uh, time span, so it went from 14 weeks to nine weeks. In 17 days, or two and a half weeks, they had 17 days from the start of training camp uh, to preseason competition, all right? And the, it, to some guys in the preseason, that's full on, that's a game, all right? So they had two and a half weeks to prepare, all right? Uh, in the first 12 days of training camp, there were 10 Achilles tendon injuries in, in the first 12 days, all right? And then five days after that, there were two more, all right? So I, out of those 10, five of those were rookies. We're talking about the younger, the younger players that are coming in with not as much money, right? They don't, they probably can't pay for per, uh, trainers. They don't have, they can't pay to go to some of the better facilities. So they might have been doing a lot of stuff at their colleges or uh, their uh, high schools, or just doing stuff on their own. Uh, and then 1997 to 2002, all right, this is the big one. Uh, Preseason and in-season injury data showed Achilles tendon ruptures occurred at a rate of five per year. All right, that's five per year. We had 10 uh, in the first 10 days, 12 days, I'm sorry. And to kind of cap off and finish off, all right, uh, you know, best case scenario, right? We don't know when this thing is going to end. We don't know what we're going to be handed. Uh, but best case scenario, this is what this, this map is showing. And I know that, you know, no situation uh, is going to be best case scenario. Best, I think Matt Campbell said in the article on Football Scoop today, best case scenario went out the door a month ago, right? But so now it's all about trying to figure out what's ideal, having an outline. Let's map it out. Like I said in the beginning, let's meet, let's talk. Uh, let's see what everybody in, in, in their respective realm has to say, look back at their experiences, figure out where they went wrong in certain things and how we can perfect it in those areas and come together and make those decisions. Uh, and then we're get this thing is evolving every day. We're getting new rules daily and that's fine. All right, we have an outline. 
all right, if we got to plug something or we get news where we get to, uh, we have to take something out. Regardless, we have a map, we have an outline. It makes it easy to try to pull things out of thin air. It's, it, and that's for, for, for me. Um, I can't speak for everybody else. Uh, so for me, all right, best case scenario, based off my experiences and what I've seen, all right, whatever that start day is going to be, I think strength and conditioning needs three weeks, strength and conditioning only. All right, we'll get into some of our movement assessments. We're here at Arizona. We work hand in hand with our training room. Uh, we take them through certain movement assessments. We get numbers, we get ranges on each individual. All right, and that helps us in some of our programming and classifying uh, the athletes and certain type of lifts, uh, certain type of exercises that'll help benefit. Some of those exercises will hopefully help improve some of those movement deficiencies or limitations. Uh, but some of those things we know that we can't fix, so how can we work around them, all right? And the biggest thing we want to work around is pain, right? Because when you start having pain, you're getting closer to having to be in the training room, and we're getting closer to possibly losing somebody. We're also going to uh, do some more testing, right? We have baseline data from earlier in the spring with our force decks, with our NOR board, or whatever taste testing you were doing before this thing hit, whatever numbers that you may have, all right, you want to do those again, right? See how far away you are from the baseline when you first started spring, knowing that you were coming. We came off a six-week break. So however long this break is going to be, it's going to give us a gauge of how far we are from, from these things, right? Then that helps us with this transition. What do we need to do? What do we, when do we need to do it? How long do we need to do it for, all right? And then that leads into what, what I call football school. And football school goes back into my experience. Uh, with OTAs in, in, in the NFL and seeing these two different perspectives. And in, in, in football school is two weeks, uh, no helmets, no pads, no football, all right? It was a morning session, okay? So strength and conditioning, we get them for some movement preps, kind of an extended warm-up where we get some blood flowing, we get them moving, real general, general specific type stuff, and then they go into an indie with their football coaches. This is when it gets real specific. This is when it starts simulating what practice is going to be. Um, and but it's you know we're not doing any team. We're not competing. It's all teaching. All right. And then we'll color code it and we'll progress that color coding as we go. Uh, and then the, the 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 coaches will leave and then we'll do what we call a player run practice. Um, and these are things that we already do, so we know how to work them. And I think a lot of people do them. Whereas a player run player run practice, football gets involved. Uh, you know, the, the players kind of, they, they challenge each other. And then you might not do it in that first week um, of football school just because you want to make sure you get your install in and make sure anybody's ready. And I'm, and I'm speaking on that from us just based on what we did in the spring with the new defensive staff. They wanted to make sure those defensive players are ready for a 7 on 7 instead of just jumping into it. So that's why I put that in parentheses. Uh, and then we can lift afterwards. Once again, we'll, uh, if we're helping prescribe practice, uh, as a as a team, then we know what the intensity for that day is going to be, and then I can help formulate lifts. So we still get some really good development in the weight room. Uh, we don't have to treat it like it's a real competition phase where I have to pull back a lot of volume and intensity. We can still hit it pretty hard and get that good development for another two weeks, and then later, maybe in the back end of the day, uh, players can come in, uh, hit some meetings, uh, possibly look at whatever went on where there might have been an install period uh, in that football school session um, or whatever, and then go over what they're installing for the next day if we get into some type of seven on seven or a period where the team's going against each other. So two weeks of that. Uh, and then on the field training activities, OTAs, three weeks, you add helmets, you add a football. Uh, we start getting into more of the seven on seven, some one on one some team periods where we get competitive. Uh, but it's that, it's that gradual transition, all right? And now you're looking at a total uh, of eight weeks right there, all right? It's, it's the, the suggested six to eight weeks. And then I think after three weeks of that, where we still are gradually increasing time, where gradually increasing intensities and those loads are gonna go up, uh, then I think we're ready for a full training camp. And, and training camp, after all of that, training camp might not have to be a full four weeks, depending on what's thrown at us. And like I said, this is just an outline. This is just the, the, the ideal situation. 
some some weeks might have to get taken off things. We have to sit as a staff, sit as an organization and figure out uh, what we can lose, what we can move around, what we might want to add once we do get a, a full a plan or a date or dates rather. Uh, and then just kind of take it from there. But I think that, you know, all of the things that we've gone through from the start of January and really looking past January uh, is going to be the key. And, and knowing your athletes, knowing the individuals, knowing where you've been, what you've done uh, is a great way to transition into maybe this new deal. And, you know, one thing, even with the NFL now, a lot of those injuries are because their OTA session ends and there's a five and a half to six week break. Um, so we you still get a, a fair number of tendon uh, injuries or any soft tissue, anything once training camp starts. I feel like this gives us a better gauge because we've seen our athletes for eight weeks before training camp without any of those long breaks. Uh, coaches, you know, as coaches, football coaches, strength coaches, period, you know, we all feel like we need more time. Time is, is one of the more valuable things for all of us. And the one thing we always, at any, the end of any period of time, we always feel like we need it more. Um, I think this is a great lead in because we're not going straight from a camp uh, or, or off season training just to camp four weeks and our coaches are cramming, cramming, cramming install. You got, you have several weeks, matter of fact, five weeks before training camp to put in install. So you actually even get to start training camp once you get into full pads and full competition and full tilt, full contact uh, to implement some things where you don't necessarily feel as rushed and you, and you have more time. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway is that we, we have to work together on it. Um, and if, if your organization isn't, or whether it is, the, the biggest thing is, is that it could always be better. And I think that's what we all have to use this time for. We have to use it wisely. We have to look at ways that we can all get better, that we can all improve uh, in what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And you might be sitting and thinking this model is crazy and it's not going to work for you. But if it, is, if it just encourages us some, some more thought, or uh, encourages you to start really thinking about what is going to be the best way for you, a best case scenario for you, then I've done my job uh, and I feel like I'm successful in that today. Uh, so uh, that, that's it for my presentation. I guess we'll, we'll take questions now. Perfect, Coach. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that a lot of guys are going to struggle with is, uh, is, is getting some guys and them not being as strong as, you know, in a perfect world you'd like them to be. So what, what, what's really your top one or two goals when your guys come back to campus? What, what do you want to see out of them? Uh, well, I'm, when they come on campus, I'm automatically assuming that we're just starting from, from ground zero. Right. And that's how I'm going to program. I'm going to program it after we came off of a huge week. I know what I, I programmed in May, um, but I'm coming in assuming that most of the guys didn't do it. And I think that goes back to what I said I was going to do in April, what we were going to do in April is that functional hypertrophy. All right, well, we're still touching some decent volume, but we're also getting some decent uh, intensity. And, and that'll help, you know, you, there's so many ways that you can do that. I love cluster sets uh, where you hit a certain amount, uh, you take a little break and then you hit more. So you get a little more volume with a lot of those, those heavier intensities. Um, how, so, how, how different is that than, uh, than if, if they had come back under a, a normal deal? It's really not much different. Yeah. Honestly, it's not much different. I might be a little more strategic. I might start at a little lower intensity. Um, just to be on the safe side. But I think that's where a lot of that testing goes too, right? You know, when we came in the spring, we did uh, a 225 test. We did a pull-up test. So that's probably what we'll do on day one. We'll do that pull-up test and we'll, we'll do that bench test again, see how, how far off those numbers are from when we, they came in off of that break in uh, December and, and, and summer January. And that'll give us a gauge on any strength losses or where guys are, you, you might be surprised. Yeah, I and would you have done the pull-up test typically if, if there wasn't the, the quarantine deal or is that yeah, an that, was, that was standard. We did that and we did that before we even had a, a clue that this was even going to happen. That was, that was day that our first day in January. Well, I, I think that's an interesting, interesting deal because that's, that's something that probably 90% of your guys can figure out a way to do at home. 
yeah. uh, right now in their own house or, you know, spending 10 bucks and ordering one of those bar things off Amazon you put on your door. Yep. Um, that that's pretty easily accessible that everyone should be able to do, uh, you know, even a modified, you know, version somehow. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think high school coaches would see a lot of value in that. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's why I say, you know, we have a lot of resources that, are, you know, high schools or, or smaller schools might not have, but that's just the testing that we do. It's all about going and figuring out what you can get done with your resources and everybody for the most part should be able to conduct some type of pull-up test some type of uh, bench press tests, and then just a test of power. You got vertical, just a regular vertical jump. Whether you had a vertical mat or you had a vertex where you do a, a vertical jump is very helpful in doing and having periods of the year where you're always testing those things. Or obviously coming off of a break uh, is good. And then um, you know a, another time of retest where you can look at improvements because that test is going to tell if what you're doing is, is actually getting you to your end goal or not. Right. What about um, uh, injury prevention stuff? Does your, your thought process change as guys come back uh, out of this? I know it's something we talked about a little bit before we, we got started here, but uh, what's, what's your thoughts as guys come back, um, you know, integrating a little more, um, you know, both injury prevention and I guess cardio, cardiovascular uh, building that back up again. Yeah, well, you know, in the NCAA, and I know a lot of high schools are going to it too, you have that acclimatization period where there are suggestions for what you do anywhere, like one to four work to rest ratios and your conditioning work, uh, you know, sets and reps, you know, really paying attention to the volume and intensity. So it's all about that, that color system transitioning back in into play uh, and regressing everything. All right, what is your end goal? Let's go all the way back to step one. And normally, if your step one is after a six-week break, then you might want to take it back a couple more steps looking at, you know, this break might end up being a little longer than six weeks, right? So it's just all about what, it, what, what drawing those past experience. What did you do before, right? Was it successful? Did you, did you get what you wanted out of it, right? And then just kind of working even a little bit more backwards from there, I think, is what, you, what we all have to do. We, we can't look at this new situation and say that everything ha is out the window, everything has to change. We have to go back and look at the things we've done before to get a really good gauge on what we need to do right now. You mentioned, uh, you know, you got some guys that have access to bands and some have, you know, weight room type stuff uh, in their garages maybe. But, uh, you know, I, I know one of, my, one of my buddies that's a power five uh, strength guy as well as having, you know, kids fill up backpacks with books and things like that is, is – I mean, what, what kind of resources like that that, you know, almost everyone has do you, you kind of recommend being a staple for these next few weeks? Oh, duff, duffel bags with books or anything that you can get in there heavy where you can get some decent load, uh, backpacks, uh, whatever's laying around the house. I mean, I have my assistant uh, makes videos of uh, holding uh, cases of water and squatting, doing single leg squats. Uh, water bottles doing, you know, uh, posterior shoulder work, uh, anything you can find that you can safely, you know, pick up, move around, get in comfortable positions in the correct positioning for, for a lot of the lifts is going to be good. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, we're, we're kind of applying a lot of time under tension uh, to help with that volume because this, those loads still, you know, you can put a bunch of textbooks in a duffel bag it won't equal what you can get on a barbell and put on your back you know what I mean or, or right. heavy dumbbells so you find other ways to manipulate and that's time under tension right TUT um, you know that slow lowers and the eccentric whether you you take five seconds to to get down in that bottom position or if you're, you're doing a push up five, you know five seconds to lower back down to the ground and then some just holds you get you hold something heavy get in certain positions one leg two legs uh, and then you count, you know, you give yourself a five second count, uh, hold it in that position, and then maybe you hit 10 reps. There are a lot of different ways you can manipulate the time under tension to keep uh, that at least some size. You know, the, I think the, the one thing that a lot of coaches and, and probably players are struggling with too is the, uh, is the mental aspect of it, just being around each other and putting the same sweat in the bucket. Um, yeah. do, you, do you see your programming having to change it all from a building mental toughness standpoint when they come back? No, I think it always is it, that those are things never change for us. We always 
uh, throwing things at them uh, to, 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 ment to mentally be able to get through adverse and uncomfortable situations. Uh, like right now, you know, guys are challenging each other on Instagram and Twitter. They're tagging each other uh, with certain work and things that they're doing to kind of, you know, get lift somebody else up. And that's something we encouraged from the beginning uh, was y'all tagging, holding each other accountable. Uh, so that culture, you know, our culture piece of accountability, uh, the leaders checking in on guys, you know, hopefully it gets to a point where, you know, our starting quarterback, our starting linebackers, our starting linemen, are calling the guys in their position group, uh, making sure that they're doing what they need to do so we come back. And that's just the culture that Coach Sumlin, you know, is trying to build. And, and that's something that as a strength staff, we do every day regardless anyway. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. If, if there's one thing positive that can come out of this, it's it's the accountability factor for the, the guys that are in the staffs that are preaching, um, you know, culture and accountability and, and all the things you just hit on. Uh, it's an opportunity for those leaders to kind of step up and separate themselves, and maybe they're in, you know, a, a better or comparable standing when they come back. Yeah. yeah that's, that's great stuff. Thanks a lot, Brian. Appreciate you taking the time, man. Uh, thank you for having me.